Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this afternoon's fireside discussion. We've got a very interesting speaker joining us today for uh, the topic around rebuilding trust in Web3. And we're going to talk about and dig a little deeper and discuss what's been happening with the FTX and, and Silvergate uh, implosion, we'll call it, and its broader implications on uh, digital asset custodians, crypto banks, and, and more um, the broader financial services landscape as well. So I'd like to first introduce our speaker today. It's Miles Pashini. He's the CEO of FV Bank. And Miles is a, an investor. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's got a ton of experience. We're looking at 30 years building innovative businesses in the mobile and financial services space. He's got, wow, seven issued patents on the payments processing side of the business. That's pretty impressive. Uh, he had a, a business, EWI Holdings, that was bought up by Blackhawk in 2006. And, you know, recently he's been working on developing uh, and he's got an award for this one as well. So you're doing pretty good on the debit card side and products um, and working with leading e-wallet and settlement operators all around the world. So first of all, welcome, Miles. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate your your perspective. Um, yeah, so maybe you can just start up things off here. We, we've got about 20 minutes for, for the next uh, while to discuss everything about, um, you know, rebuilding trust in Web3 and the role of custodians and banks. So maybe you could just start with telling us a little bit more about yourself and the story of how you got into and how you launched FE Bank and really what your, your vision for the business is. Yeah, so I, I consider myself a, a payments junkie I, and, and have been working and building payments businesses before the word fintech was really thrown around. Um, as you mentioned, I, I developed some technology around prepaid, uh, which I think we had six, seven, eight patents around that we sold out to Blackhawk in 2006. And then I went on to be the co-founder of a company that was called Wavecrest, where we were the first company to implement a crypto link debit card. That was where you would swipe a Visa card and instead of spending dollars or euros, you'd be spending Bitcoin on the back end. Um, and that was a very interesting ride for us. We grew that from zero customers to about a million cardholders in 70 countries. And we learned uh, a lot, a lot about, you know, what is the intersection between traditional finance and crypto and how do those two uh, work together or not work together? Um, and so that really led us to um, developing FV Bank. FV stands for FinTech Ventures. So it's FinTech Ventures Bank is the uh, long version of it. Um, and really, we wanted to build a purpose-built financial institution from the ground up, from you know, regulatory licensing to bespoke compliance functions and a tech stack that would support what we saw as being kind of the emerging industry in banking and finance, which was some you know, Venn diagram between blockchain and digital assets and traditional banking and being really the key provider in that space. It's impressive. So, yeah, you're right on the front line of, of all the innovation. And, you know, obviously, just to sort of dovetail into this topic around um, safeguarding digital assets, I mean, the from from your perspective, maybe we can start with what do you think and, and how is it going from your perspective, the, the role of custodians with digital assets and uh, in light of the current you know market news and its impact and just love to get your thoughts on you know, where the industry's at today and, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, the big issue or uh, maybe the elephant in the room is the gross misconception of what a custodian actually, actually is. Um, the word custodian has been thrown around very loosely for, you know, in the crypto space really from inception. So the idea that um, I send you my, my Bitcoin and you're my custodian, that's just, yes, you are, you are custodying my Bitcoin, meaning that you, you control the private keys to it. But that doesn't mean you're qualified to do so. And so I think the biggest misconception and what's led to a lot of the tragedies in the market is that you have people who are calling themselves custodians, but they're not qualified custodians. They're not regulated. They don't have any security procedures. They don't have lic you know, licenses to, to perform. Um, they're not carrying out the normal practices that, that someone with a custodial or fiduciary responsibility would carry out. And so I think that's the starting point is let's define what a custodian is. Um, a real custodian is someone who is licensed to do so and somebody who has um, you know, all of the security controls, the operational compliance, et cetera, controls in place in order to act um, in, the capac in that capacity. And I think you know, if we look back, the folks who've had loss of people's assets 
um, to date, I, I don't know of any licensed or qualified custodian who's actually launched digital assets. Um, I know of a lot of uh, unlicensed, unregulated custodians who've lost people's assets, right? So I think that's first is getting the definition. What, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about qualified custodians? Or are we talking about people who claim they provide custody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and is, um, tell me about the, the FV Bank um, regulatory licensing that you've gone through and you know, how difficult was that to obtain? And you know, we're, we're basically saying there's an unregulated side that claimed they're custodians and then you know, there's, there's the FV Bank approach. Yeah, so uh, in our case, we have what's called an IFE license. It stands for International Financial Enterprise, and it's it's a bank license that has an international charter. So our business model is to provide services to both domestic and non-domestic customers. Um, inherent with most bank licenses in the United States is the ability to 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 act as a custodian. That's kind of uh, and the OCC affirmed that around 2017, I think it was or 2018, um, that. Um, you know, that a bank has historically provided custody and that providing custody of digital assets was, um, was no, generally no different. And so in our case, what we did was we went to our regulator and we said, look, we understand that we have custodial rights within our license, but we want specific permission um, to custody digital assets because there are, you know, infrastructure and other implications to, uh, to being a custodian of digital assets. And so in our case, we went to our regulator, we sought specific permission and ultimately obtained it um, to be a digital asset custodian. And which is a great answer. And obviously for, for those listeners who weren't aware that, you know, Miles is speaking from the US perspective, which is slightly different than, than here in the Canada, but um, what, what sort of volume, how, how, how much uh, dollar volume are you a custodian for in terms of assets? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't publish our numbers uh, yet. We're working on a strategy for proof of reserves, which is really, I think, one of the discussions that we could get into today. Um, but we're really in the early stages of it. Um, it's not that we don't want to disclose, you know, our assets. It's that or that we're that we're managing for third parties. Um, but it, we're really in the early stages. We've taken conservative approach to this business. Um, we started out with only offering custody for Bitcoin. Um, and we're now releasing Ethereum and a couple of other stable coins. And then by mid uh, Q2 of this year, we'll, we'll start offering settlement of those uh, assets in the bank, meaning that if we're custodying your digital assets for you, you can instruct us to liquidate them. Um, and that'll be an integrated function in the bank. And so, um, you know, we're, we're not at the phase where I would say it's a huge part of the business compared to the banking side, but we've taken a conservative approach. Um, we launched what we call a controlled private beta um, back in November, and we've been operating under that controlled private beta in order to ensure that we get everything right. And so, um, you know, that's one of the things I would caution any bank who's getting interested in this space is that this is a multifaceted approach. It's not just the IT side. Um, you know, there's legal considerations, there's operational considerations that have to be taken into complace. Uh, they, and there's accounting considerations. You know, we um, one thing is a qualified custodian. They're they're not your assets, right? Uh, they, they belong to somebody else. And so you have a, accounting implications about how you report um, your assets versus assets which you have under custody. So we've taken this conservative approach, taking our time to launch it and roll it out. And we think we'll do a full rollout sometime in Q2 of this year. Well, that's exciting times. So let, let's talk a little bit about the, the problems that have been sort of rearing in, in their head in industry, these exploits, some of the security risks, and maybe some of the lessons from what's what's been going on with uh, FTX and others. And I know you talked a little bit about uh, that with, you know, the scope of what you're doing at the bank, the business model approach, but, you know, can you just dig in a little deeper? What, what where did you see the, the main issues and problems and, you know, what, what can we learn from that today? Yeah, so I, I think to be, you know, frank with yourself, you have to you have to really embrace both sides of this equation. One is self custody, and what that means. Self custody means that you you know you you control your private keys to your own assets, and then there's uh, having a custodian, so you're you're uh, authorizing or and you're delegating someone to control that for you. And so I think if you start there and understanding that um, if you are going to delegate that to somebody else, that that person should be um, they should have the right infrastructure in place. They should have the right regulatory requirements. They should be, uh, you know, have their 
systems reviewed by third parties, um, et cetera. So if you look in the cases of implosion, um, first of all, the parties that were holding the assets. So if you take FTX, I mean, they were basically taking customers', customers assets that were supposedly under custody or even Celsius, uh, for example, that were supposedly under custody, but then they were, the, the, the enterprise was using those assets for their own benefit, right? When you're a custodian, you don't use those assets for your own benefit. They're segregated. Um, you take instruction only for the client as to what to do with those assets, and, and you can only act in the interest of the client. In the case of these other implosions, um, they were treating those as the enterprise's assets, and they were investing them, rehypothecating them, doing many things with them that they shouldn't have been doing. And so therefore, when there was, you know, call it a run on the bank or a run on the exchange, um, they didn't have those assets to return to their customers. And so it was a fundamental breakdown in what a custodian is. A custodian is not uh, someone who can take your assets and do as they wish with them. They need to segregate them and their job is to secure them and their job is to act on the, on the instructions of their customer uh, with those assets. And so you just have this very fundamental breakdown of what is the role of a custodian? And a role of a custodian is not to take your customer's assets and do what you want with them. Yeah, it's uh, a lot. A lot can be said for for that. So, um, you know, we're 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 talking about tran transparency or or maybe standards or um, emerging regulation that's required to really put a stop to you know industry bleeding out in this area. Is it really more from a security? perspective that needs to be beefed up and you know we see all these defy yield services trying to um have liquidity pools created they don't have the appropriate licensing um can you just talk to a little bit about you know the the trade-offs that industry is making and and really where the regulators should be focusing in in your perspective it it sounds like it's a clear line but just another opportunity to to talk about it from a different perspective perhaps yeah, so I mean, first of all, while you know my my day-to-day uh, -day role is I'm the CEO of a of a regulated financial institution, um, I really like the some of the you know potential benefits that are coming out of blockchain. I mean, that's what excites us about this business. So the, the idea of you know decentralized uh, finance protocols is really interesting. Um, the idea that you could kind of uh, allow uh, clients to directly participate as capital providers, uh, you know, or borrowers in a, in a kind of a direct relationship. So in a sense, cutting out the middleman, um, that is really what a DeFi protocol is it. You have capital providers, you have borrowers, uh, and they directly interact through a smart contract. So we think that is very interesting. Um, I, I do believe that that type of scenario will evolve into a very positive space. But I do believe we're going to see initially like gro growth in what I would call or what the industry calls permission DeFi. Um, and permission DeFi is a couple of things. One is that you need to know who the counterparties are in the, in the, in the DeFi protocol. So, you know, for example, if, if I was going to put, uh, uh, you know, $100,000 into a DeFi protocol and you were, uh, not you, but let's say that um, some sanctioned person uh, wanted to be the borrower, I wouldn't want to participate in that transaction, right? That would be against the law. So if I don't know who the counterparties are in the pool, then how can a financial institution participate or how can they have their, their clients participate? And so I think at a very minimum, you're going to have permissioned pools where all of the parties have been KYC'd and sanction checked. That's kind of a beginning point. And you're starting to see some protocols being developed. Um, there's some that we know of, in fact, with disclosure, some we've invested in called Ug Network, which is building protocols where the participants in a DeFi application are all uh, ID verified, they're all sanction screened. And so, so that's kind of a basic prerequisite. If a financial institution is going to get involved and, and let's say they're going to maybe run a node and have people participate in, in a DeFi pool, at a very minimum, those pools are going to have to have things like KYC and AML, AML participants. So that you know that as a borrower or a capital provider, you're not dealing with someone who's uh, been sanctioned, for example. And, and if, uh, you know, a crypto bank or a custodian had that level of permission to, um, and, and met all those requirements um, that you were just talking about, do you think it would qualify for insurance? I mean, we, we've seen a lot of discussions around FDIC and obviously here in Canada, we put our money in, in the bank, traditional bank, and we hope if something happens to it, um, that it's insured. Although I know there's a lot of cases that 
uh, you know, a fraud, fraudulent case that the onus is actually on the customer, but what are the prospects of, of ensuring the digital asset custodians and, and the value or any, any innovation that's happening in there in that, that area? Uh, so, I mean, you, as a custodian, as a, as a qualified custodian, you can insure today. I mean, there are, you know, there are insurers that will insure. Um, and if you look at some of the bigger ones like BitGo and Anchorage and, you know, the, the, the larger di- that are companies that are really focused on digital asset custody, um, to the best of my knowledge, they have insurance policies. And so, and we know for a fact at, at FB Bank that there are insurers for digital asset custody, um, but it's private insurance. Um, so to the concept of, you know, a, a public policy type insurance like FDIC or SIPC, I don't see that coming soon. Um, I think that anybody who's going to offer those types of services is going to have to privately insure. And essentially you're, you're, you're insuring, uh, you know, I think, I think the first level of insurance, if you will, will not be over the investment itself, but it will be over the security of the asset. So, uh, you know, breach of or loss of private keys, for example, that would result in a loss um, uh, in those protocols. So I, I think that um, there will be private insurance. You're also starting to see decentralized insurance protocols come out where um, there is essentially a DeFi protocols that will insure assets in another protocol. Mm-hmm. And you're starting to see that already emerge. Oh, that's super interesting. What, what about the, the proof of reserves that you touched upon earlier and maybe other any other sort of industry-led uh, initiatives in effort to add more transparency and try to establish some sort of, uh, you know, self-managing guidelines? Yeah, so I, I think it's a complicated space, first of all. I don't think there's a, you know, silver bullet answer to this. Um, if you start out with regulated custodians, like in the case of FB Bank, we, we have to file a monthly reserve report. Um, with our regulator, we also file a quarterly report, which is called a call report, um, all, all banks do. And so at least you have oversight, right, where the regulator um, is getting these, you know, frequent reports about your assets. Um, it's mostly on the banking side today, but that's going to evolve as more banks become digital asset custodians. Um, they're going to, you know, that these reports will at least provide a level of oversight. Um, if you get into really like technical proof of, re- proof of reserves, um, there's a lot of research being, you know, going on today. Um, interesting, you know, Binance is one of the entities that's really leading on trying to create some best practices in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it gets very technical, frankly, o- over my head, some of the deep, you know, the technicalities of exactly how um, these proof of reserve schemes are being developed. But I know that there's, uh, there is an effort in the industry. Um, you've seen some voices coming out of companies like Kraken, Um, voices coming out of companies like Binance that are working on best practices without regulation. And I think that's really healthy for the industry. Um, At FB Bank, we will be adopting our own version of proof of reserves that we think is a a best way to to articulate the security of the assets or the the fact that we're holding the assets to our customers. Um, But there's not an industry standard yet. Um, I don't personally foresee something will be coming from regulators in the near term. I think in the near term, you'll see more along the lines of what we do at the bank, which is frequent reporting, mm-hmm. as opposed to technical proof of reserves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's just an easier bridge into the tr- more traditional approach that the regulators have in, in their tools and how, how they regulate and monitor market activity. But, you know, on the regulatory comments, are there are there emerging, um, you know, we, we all know there's a, a crypto crackdown, we'll just call it for lack of a better word, but the, the regulations that would I- impact custodians uh, in the U.S. that are emerging, uh, or are they taking a, a backseat approach for custodians that are regulated? And um, so emerging regulations, are there any coming? And to that eff- effect, do you have any advice? If you had uh, you know, a panel with the regulators, what would you be telling them today? So I, I think we will see some uh, regulation come out. I think one is that we're just going to see a clarification that certain existing laws are applicable to this, you know, to the crypto space. I mean, the, the banking laws are very clear today. Um, there's not much question there. Um, I, I would, re- you know, uh, a, a ca- caution, but I would rarely agree with some of the comments that Gary Gensler makes. But just two days ago, you know, he made some comments, which is relatively common sense is that, you know, there are laws on the books today with regards to how a custodian is supposed to act and manage assets. And I think the first step is just recognize that if you're gonna label yourself as a custodian, 
you need to follow those rules. Um, there are very clear guidelines from the SEC. Um, there's guidelines uh, that we have, trust guidelines that come out of the FDIC manuals. And so, you know, these things are written, they've been around. And, and if you're gonna act in this space, you should pick up the guidelines that exist already. And, you know, ask yourself, are we following these guidelines um, as an enterprise? So I think that's the first space. Um, as far as new regulation, again, I think you're going you're gonna to have clarification that things like KYC, AML, uh, travel rule, uh, those types of things are going to be applicable, equally applicable to crypto. So if I'm sending a wire today as a bank, I have, I have very clear regulation about the data I need to collect and maintain and report with that, with that wire transaction. I think you're going to see the same be clarified that, hey, if you're using a stable coin and you're sending it from party A to party B, the same rules apply. You need to know who the sender, who the receiver is. You need to be able to report that, you know, it, it, in a, an appropriate way to a regulator and so, or law enforcement, et cetera. And I think, so I think there'll be clarification around those aspects. Um, I, I don't think that's, there's, cl that's clarification. That's not necessarily new regulation. Um, I think new regulation, we will see around stablecoin issuance. Uh, that's an area where I think that the regulator should step in and they should clarify who can be the issuer of a stable coin and what are the conditions of being uh, a stable coin issuer. And I think that stable coins have a lot of great promise in commerce. Um, they'll, they'll really help speed up uh, the way that, that business takes place. They're, they're an excellent tool. Um, you mentioned earlier that I had seven or eight patents in my name in the last couple of years, I've gotten additional patents on stable coins. So something I'm very passionate about. Oh, wow. and, um, and so I think this is gonna be an area of great growth. It would be great if the regulator would come out and clarify um, if you're the issuer of a stable coin that purports to be one for one to a dollar, for example, what that actually means. Uh, like, how do you need to hold your reserves, how those reserves are, are verified, how they're accounted for, et cetera. And I think that would be great guidance uh, uh, from a regulator. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm being uh, so uh, conscious of time here. We're going to have one last question, give you an opportunity to, um, you know, just sum things up from your perspective about you know, we're rebuilding trust, which is is the discussion topic today in, in Web3 and sort of the role of custodians and, and banks, uh, as well as any any sectors in, in in blockchain innovation from, you know, financial perspective that you think, like you touched upon stable coins that excite you and sort of where you think uh, you'd like, you know, FV Bank to be in, in the next few years as well, just as we close this session. Yeah, so we're trying to create, you know, I, again, I'll use the word, the Venn diagram, we're trying to create this intersection between the digital economy or the blockchain economy and banking and find a suite of services that we can offer to our clients, um, which is mostly institutional today, but it, it'll move more into retail, I think, in the future. Um, and, and that's, you know, doing things like we've integrated USDC as a deposit and payment method directly into the bank. Um, that is not necessarily a Web3 thing, but it really does create interesting scenarios for commerce um, where, you know, a, a, if I'm raising an invoice uh, for my products or services, someone can pay me with a bank wire or a Visa or MasterCard, or they can pay me with a stable coin. And I can receive that stable coin directly to my bank account and, and, and have it uh, at what we call atomically convert to dollars. So, um, so that's a very good way to receive payments and to make payments too. If you're making payments around the world, for example, if I need to send a million dollars to China because I'm buying some, you know, some goods being made for me. Um, today I send a wire that's going to take a couple of days, etc. Um, I can send a USDC transfer that will take under 20 minutes. The receiver has a non-reversible secure transaction, um, and we, as the financial institution, we know who the sender, the receiver is. We treat it just like a wire. And so, you know, while that won't be out on your bleeding edge of Web3 discussions. Um, it is really a new way of doing business. It's creating new rails for conducting commerce and doing them in a responsible way. And so we're working on stuff like that. Um, I do think that the banks of the future, which is what we want FB to be, is um, gonna be really an integrated environment. So as an end user or a business, I can hold a multitude of assets, whether they be digital or traditional. Um, and then inside of my bank and my regulated environment, I can manage them. I can liquidate them, I can acquire more, I can transfer them. And so I think giving some people an ecosystem where they can manage what the future of money is going to look like in a safe and, and cohesive environment, I think that's really what we're, what we're trying to build. And we're getting close to it, right? We're getting close to at least the MVP of that, 
where people can say, hey, the future of banking looks like this. I don't just have dollars anymore, but I have a number of assets. And when you, you know, I think in the Web3 world, we're going to have a lot of interesting assets, right? Are they NFTs? Are they, you know, loyalty type programs that move to the blockchain? Um, there's going to be a lot of new digital value that people want to manage in their, in their accounts. No, that's fantastic. Well, I uh, want to thank you on behalf of all the attendees and the team here at FF Combiles for sharing your, your insights. I uh, want to wish you, you know, all the best in the future at FE Bank. We'll certainly be following and tracking your, your story, try to promote you where we, we can, of course, saying uh, that the future is bright still today. I think, you know, Miles touched upon the, the evolution that we've in industry from, you know, different roles uh, in perspectives, but we've seen a ton of growth, a ton of innovation. Uh, it's not going away. So while there's a few um, healthy bumps in, in the road from a wide variety of perspectives, I think we get the right participants and the right approach to industry that will uh, get to that next iteration that uh, Miles was talking about at FE Bank. So thanks again, Miles. Really appreciate your, your coming out here to have this fireside, uh, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks for tuning in. I'm excited to introduce our next panel, which is all about beyond digital banking and embedded finance. I'd like to introduce Ritesh Andley. He's the Director of Banking and FinTech Products at Amdocs Technologies, and he'll be introducing the panelists. Over to you, Ritesh.